thanks for the the invitation thanks for the introduction um what i want to tell you about uh today is um the collective swimming in fish and and specifically the evolution of collective swimming in fish and so the, the bigger question here is um so how does collective swimming evolve when the environment changes? So you can imagine you have a group of fish uh, that are in a certain environment and um, maybe they school, maybe they do something else, but in some way their collective behavior is optimized for the environment they live in. Um, and then that environment changes. Maybe they colonize a new location that has different environmental conditions, or maybe they stay in the same place, but the conditions in that place change. Um, either way, if you give them enough time, you expect evolution to, uh, in some sense, re-optimize their behavior for, for their new environmental uh, conditions. But the way that happens is, is pretty complex and involves a lot of steps that are still uh, very poorly understood, right? You, you start from genes, you have genetic uh, mutations or maybe genetic plasticity, uh, which then uh, changes the morphology, the, the neural circuitry, the uh, neurochemistry of, of the fish's brain um, that then changes their individual behavior, the way they process information, the way they uh, they respond to the presence of their neighbors, that in turn creates some kind of emergent collective behavior, which hopefully at the end of the day uh, gives them uh, some kind of a fitness advantage. Uh, and so today I, I'm going to focus uh, primarily on, on this uh, step here that goes from individual to collective behavior, but I also hope to convey that the, the species I'm going to talk about is actually well suited to study all of the other steps. Um, and it's actually even though it's it's early days of of applying uh, some of the physical approaches uh, to collective motion to that species there's a, a community of of wonderful biologists that have been looking at some of the other steps uh, particularly in the in the last 10 years so um the species in question you may have heard of it if you're uh, if you keep fish at home um it apparently it's popular among amongst uh aquarists it's called the mexican tetra and uh, originally it is um it, it looks like the one on the left here uh it's found in uh in texas and eastern mexico and it lives in rivers and lakes uh, but over the past uh, one or two uh, hundred thousand years it's also colonized a series of caves in eastern mexico um and uh it's so what happens is it's an irreversible process, right? They maybe the, the uh, water level rises and and the fish are able to swim into the cave, and then the water withdraws and they're trapped in there, and then they um, they start evolving independently from the fish that stayed outside of the cave, and so um, they adapt to their cave environment. Uh, and so there there are a, a few features that make this a, a really interesting species to study evolution. Uh, one is that. Uh, it's it's uh, been long enough that they've developed significant morphological and behavioral differences to adapt to their cave environment. But at the same time, it's uh, recent enough that they're still the same species. So they, they, there are still a lot of similarities and, and they can be crossbred. Um, and another uh, cool feature is that this has happened not just once, but multiple times in different caves. Uh, you have different groups of fish that all looked like uh, the one on the left that have colonized different caves. And they've all adapted independently to their new cave environment. Um, and um, but because those ca those cave cave environments are similar, right? They're facing similar situations: lack of light, uh, food scarcity, no predators. They've evolved uh, in parallel. They've evolved uh, a set of, of very similar traits, um, which is the reason why they're collectively known as the cave form. And so the, the three fish images on the right here, those are uh, from three different caves, and they've all evolved. Uh, so separately from from a fish looking like the one on the left um so there are a lot of of differences between the surface form and the cave form but the the two that are most uh, important for the purpose of this talk are that uh, the cave fish no longer see um, because there there's no light in the cave so there's no point in having eyes anymore um and they no longer school um and so um i want to tell you three short stories about uh, those fish today and uh, the first one is kind of necessary to to go any further is um convincing ourselves that there is the loss of schooling is indeed a behavioral adaptation to cave environment and not just a consequence of the lack of visual input uh, so that would be uh, that will be the first story um and then I'll I'll talk a little bit about um the, the some kind of collective behavior that we have observed in cave fish that even though they no longer school uh, they still have uh, some kind of collective response to crowdedness where they're able to uh, to tune their their exploration strategies 
um, collectively. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the um, developmental aspect, uh, how, how schooling arises in, uh, in larvae. All right, so the first question is, uh, does the loss of sight explain, explain entirely the loss of schooling or, or is there more going on? Is this uh, an adaptation, um, an, an evolved trait? So the setup is a, um, a circular tank uh, filmed from above. That's the, the screenshot here on the left. We have between one and, uh, and 10 fish in the, in the tank. We filmed them for uh, 20 minutes. Um, and then uh, we use an in-house uh, video tracking software to extract the trajectories. Uh, the, the image in the middle here is about 30 seconds worth of trajectories from five surface fish that are uh, swimming together. And then the image, uh, the image on the right is, is also 30 seconds, but of uh, cave fish that are not uh, swimming together. Now, uh, the way we're going to um, try to address this, this question um, here is to look at uh, pairs of fish. And uh, we're going to look at, at two points. So we're going to look at every pair of fish. Uh, you have uh, a group of 10 fish swimming together. We look at every possible pair in every frame of the video. Uh, and for each of those pairs, we measure the distance between the two fish and we measure the angle between their swimming directions. Right. And so then we can uh, plot a, a, a joint distribution function uh, of those two quantities. We have the distance on the horizontal, uh, horizontal axis. So if you're on the right of the diagram, um, the, the fish are far from each other. If you're all the way to the right, they're on, on opposite sides of the tank. If you're on the left of the diagram, they're very close to each other. Uh, if you're on the, the bottom of the diagram, they're, uh, they're aligned, they're swimming in the same direction. If you're at the top of the diagram, they're swimming in opposite directions. And so if you look at 10 surface fish, uh, you uh, see something that, that um, is reflective of, of schooling, right? We have the, uh, the color here is, is uh, where we find um, those pairs. They have short distances uh, because they like swimming, uh, swimming together and they have small angles between their directions because they like swimming in the same direction. And so that, um, that is schooling. Uh, the uh, dark uh, spot in the bottom left column. So now before looking at cave fish, uh, we look at surface fish, but in the dark. Right, so those are still fish that like to school, but we're depriving them of visual input. So now we see, um, and, and I should point out that the, the color here is not si significant. Uh, it's about the darkness. The, there's the color pattern is from a paper where each population has a different color to help keep track of data that is relative to each population throughout the paper, but uh, I could have made them both blue. Uh, what matters is, is where the color is darker versus lighter. Um, so now those fish are, are no longer able to, to school. So we find them with all sorts of, of distances between them and all sorts of angles between them. So the, the color spreads over the entire range of available uh, distances and angles. Uh, we also see those two uh, sort of arches, uh, this pattern here, that actually doesn't have anything to do with collective swimming uh, this is uh, this is due to the fact that those fish like to uh, swim along the walls, and so if you if you imagine two fish that are swimming uh, along the walls of a circular arena, even if they're not swimming together, uh, the fact that they're both swimming along the walls implies a, a mathematical relationship between the distance between them and the angle between their swimming directions, and that's um, that's what explains those two arches that are sort of um, mirror images of each other, one one upside down. But the feature that's actually interesting here is this dark spot uh, in the bottom left, right? And that is telling us that um, those surface fish, even in the dark when they're no longer able to school, they uh, are still more likely to be close to each other. And they're still more likely to be aligned, especially if they are uh, close to each other. Right? And so if you look at the videos, um, you can see that when they um, come, when they encounter each other, it looks like they're, they're trying to stay together for a little bit. But then when they drift apart, because they, uh, they can't see, they can't find each other again. Um, but if they uh, come close, and especially if they're swimming in the same direction, they will, they will um, try to keep swimming in the same direction for a little bit. Now, if you contrast that with um, cave fish, you can see that it still spreads uh, all over the, the available distances and, and angles because they are still not schooling. Uh, you still have the arches because they still like to fold the walls, but you don't have uh, the uh, the dark spots in the bottom left uh, corner at all, uh, which indicates that they they're not attempting to um, align or to get close to each other at all. Uh, another way you can look at it is to look uh, more specifically at, at the alignment when they are close to each other. 
So this is the uh, polar alignment parameter. That's basically the, the dot product of the uh, the two unit vectors that define the, the swimming um, directions of those two fish. Uh, and so it's one if they're swimming in the same direction, minus one if they're swimming in opposite directions. For uh, surface fish in the light, that's the, the blue bar, it's nearly one because when they're near each other, they're swimming almost in the same direction. Uh, when they're in the dark, that's the purple bar. Um, it's not one because they're they're not uh, as successful at spooling, but it's still they're still um, much more likely to be uh, swimming in the same direction than um, than in opposite directions. But uh, the, the cave populations, and not just the Patron cave, all three uh, cave populations that we've tested, uh, they no longer seem to have any kind of preference for um, alignment. And so that um, they were, I should say also there was. A, some indirect evidence um, prior to to this um, of genetic uh, from genetic studies that um, so the genetic pathways that lead to the loss of schooling uh, were partly the same as loss of sight but partly different as well. Um, but this it confirms through direct observation of the trajectories of those fish that the the loss of schooling is indeed not just um, a consequence of of uh, the loss of sight, uh, but it, it is uh, an actual evolved uh, trait. So that's the first um, story. The second one is uh, about asocial collective behavior, uh, if you will. Uh, so one thing we, we noticed with the cave fish is uh, I've already said that they, they spend a lot of um, time um, near the walls. They like to follow the walls. That, that's why we had those arches um, in, um, in those uh, diagrams earlier. And so um, we looked at the, the fraction of time they spend in near the center of the tank. Uh, basically, we, we split the, the tank into an inner half and an outer half. Uh, not, it's not a, a physical separation. They, they can still free, um, swim anywhere. It's just a, a definitional um, uh, split. Um, and so we measure the fraction of the time that they spend in the inner half of the tank. And uh, horizontally, it's the number of fish in the tank. So if you have one fish in the tank, um, a, they spend about 10 to 15 percent of the time in the inner half, and um, consequently 85 to 90 percent of the time in the outer half, closer to the walls. Uh, but then, if you increase uh, the group size, if you have more fish in the tank, uh, they uh, they spend less time at the wall and and more time in the center. So they explore a little bit further uh, away from the walls. Um, and so then the question is is um, how does that come about? Well, you could imagine that it's some kind of repulsion that they. Uh, make a conscious uh, decision to swim away from each other, uh, but that's not really what we observe. And in fact, they, those guys will swim um, right in each other's face uh, and, and ignore each other until they're basically about to bump into each other. So uh, here, this, this is a, an overlay of a, a few um, um, frames uh, from a video where you have a, a fish arriving along the blue arrow from the bottom and a, a green one arriving from the top along this uh, wall, which is in, in black. And, and they go right at each other until the last moment where they freak out and do a, you know, a sudden turn. Um, but it doesn't look like they're avoiding each other when they're still far from each other. So it's, um, it must be a, another uh, mechanism. And also this repulsion wouldn't really address why they spend so much time at the wall in the first place. Um, but uh, so before I, I got interested in those fish, I, I uh, worked a lot on, on simpler versions of uh, self-repelled particles, on, on abstract, simplified um, idealizations of, of motile particles, things like active Brownian particles and, and run and tumble particles. And uh, this tendency to align or to, sorry, accumulate at the walls is actually something that's extremely generic. Uh, it's been seen in, in lots of things, in, in sperm cells, in bacteria, and also in, in those, uh, in, in simulations of those idealized, um, the, the simplest, uh, kind of self-propelled particle you can you can um, write equations for uh, still does that. And at its core, the most basic uh, sort of explanation of that is is just that um, when something that's motile is not at a wall, it's going to be swimming at a certain speed. And when it's at a wall, uh, it's going to be swimming on average slower because there's a chance that it's swimming towards the wall and it it uh, takes some time to turn around. And so they um, swim, they move on average slower when they're at the wall. And that's enough, right? If, you, if you're if you going slower when you're at the wall, you're going to spend a little bit more time there. Uh, and that's enough to get wall accumulation. Now, the details and the extent of that wall accumulation are going to depend on, on the details um, of, of the, the motility mechanism, on the details of the interaction with the wall. 
but when it's framed like that, it's it's easy to see why it's such a generative um, feature. Now, the other thing we know from um, those simple um, uh, simulations of uh, or simple self-propelled particle models is that uh, the extent of that wall accumulation is controlled by uh, or, or controlled to a large extent by the persistence length. The persistence length is the distance that those objects travel before they change their direction below. Um, and that in turn is uh, proportional to the speed and inversely proportional to the, the amount of turning. So if you're moving fast and you're not turning very much, you're going to travel a large distance before you change your direction. So that's a large persistence length, and that leads to more accumulation at the wall. And um, if we look at the speed of those um, k-fish, uh, so this is the, the speed distribution um, of k-fish, and each curve corresponds to a different number of fish in the tank. And the lighter one uh, is, is one fish in the tank, the darkest one is 10 fish in the tank, and you have uh, two and five uh, in between. And so what we see is that when there are more fish uh, in the tank, they swim slower. And it's not uh, just that they slow down when they're near another fish. It's the entire uh, speed distribution shifts to, to lower values. And so it seems that they're, uh, it's more like a quorum sensing type of situation where they're able to uh, assess how crowded the tank is as a whole and um, adjust their average swimming speed as a result of that. Um, and so if you um, decrease the speed, then uh, you decrease the persistence length, and that decreases the accumulation at the wall. And so to test that, we did uh, simulations of a, a simplified uh, model of those fish, not quite as simple as, as active brand and particles, because we still wanted to capture, uh, for example, the fact that they, they like to swim along the wall, so there's a wall alignment term. Um, and we, we measured the, the uh, parameters of the model uh, in the uh, in the experimental data, and then we ran simulations where um, we have only one fish in the tank or, or multiple fish that don't interact. That's that's functionally the same thing, um, but we uh, we plug in the uh, the the slowdown that we observed in the experiments when there were more fish, and so we can show that even if they don't explicitly interact with each other, just slowing down the way we've seen them slow down in the experiments uh, is enough to explain a lot of that uh, shift in exploration strategy, of that increased time um, spent away from the walls and in the center. Uh, and so it, it looks um, like this is an actual um, strategy or, or a shift in exploration strategy in, in response to crowdedness. Uh, so it, it is a kind of collective behavior, but it's not your traditional kind of collective behavior that is mediated by uh, sort of pairwise um, interactions or responding to how your close neighbors are moving. Uh, it's it's more indirect. It happens through sensing how crowded the environment is, adjusting your mean swimming speed, and that in turn changes the, the relative amount of time spent uh, near the walls versus away from the walls. All right, so that was the, uh, the second story. Um, and the last um, thing I want to talk about is, is uh, some more recent work on the, the development of um, of schooling uh, in those fish. Um, and so some of the, of the questions, uh, some of the things we were uh, wondering about going into it, um, one is uh, whether this, the appearance of, um, of schooling is happens all at once or in multiple steps. Um, so we know, for example, that there are um, fish that school, so they like to um, stay close to each other and go in the same direction. There are also fish that shoal. They like to be close to each other but they don't care uh, about going in the same direction. And so you can imagine that those are uh, the, sort of the genetic and neural architectures for, for aligning um, and, and, um, and getting close to each other could be different. And so these could arise at different steps, uh, at different stages in development. Uh, you could also imagine um, in cave fish specifically, because cave fish are descended from surface fish that used to school, uh, you could imagine a situation where early on in development, they um, they start to develop some kind of schooling-like behavior that then gets reversed. That's actually what happens uh, with their eyes, where uh, or it happens earlier than what we look at. It happens while they're still in the egg. But the cavefish actually start uh, developing uh, eyes when they're during the first day post fertilization. But then eventually the the eyes degenerate, uh, de degenerate, and and by the time they're um, out of the egg, they they no longer um, have eyes. 
And so uh, to look at that, we, we have a, a sort of similar setup to what I've uh, described above. We have uh, still a, a quasi 2D um, shallow tank. Uh, we have uh, sort of five, five uh, larvae in, in each tank, um, uh, surface fish in, in one population of jayfish from the Pachon cave. And we look at four different time points, uh, 7, 28, 42, and 70 days post-fertilization. So that's one week, four weeks, seven weeks, and, and 10 weeks. Um, and the, the size of the arena scales with uh, with the fish size. So the, the arena grows as the fish grow. The, the diameter of the tank is about 20 uh, body length. Um, and so the, the first thing we look at is uh, statistics of the angle between the fish and uh, and the distance or the angle between um, nearest neighbors and, and distance between uh, nearest neighbors. And without going into all the details, we see first sign of alignment uh, in surface fish at uh, four weeks, and then uh, the first sign of preference for proximity at 42 weeks, um, which is the next time point. So it's not a very strong signal, so there's still a chance that they happen together, but it, there's um, this sort of suggests that they may develop alignment um, slightly before proximity. Um, and with K-fish, though, it's very clear that they don't develop um, either a preference for alignment or a preference for proximity at, at any point uh, during their development. Um, another way we look at that is, is by uh, looking at force maps. Um, and so uh, you, have, you imagine that you focus on one fish, uh, so it's the focal fish that's a little uh, sort of dark uh, or shadow that's in the center of, of each circle. And you imagine it's pointing up, so you're using a, a frame of reference where uh, the, the front of the fish is up. Uh, and then you ask, what is the um, average swimming force or the average acceleration of that focal fish as a function of where the neighbors are? And so, for example, here uh, in the top right, uh, that surface fish that are that have already started started to school. And so, what you see the red at the top tells you that if the fish in front, um, then the, the focal fish will tend to speed up to catch up. And if there's a fish in the back, it will tend to to slow down. Um, and then the the, bo the bottom row is about turning. Uh, towards neighbors, turning to the side where uh, there's a neighbor, and so on. Um, and so this um, confirms uh, what we were seeing in the in, in the previous slide. It, it's a little bit less sensitive, so we pick up the first signs of attraction and alignment like one time point later than than we did in the previous slide. But we still um, pick up signs of uh, alignment slightly before um, signs. Uh, signs of attraction. We also see that early on in their development, at one week and four weeks specifically, um, they actually repel. So th at that stage, the uh, this is all surface fish. But the, at that stage, the surface fish and the cave fish uh, actually behave similarly. But it but it's all um, it's all repulsive. Um, so um, and and the hope here is that um, you know by identifying. Uh, when those come up, we can later on use some of the uh, genetic tools that have been developed by by the wonderful biologists working on this to try to um, to uncover some of the underpinnings uh, or genetic underpinnings of um, of uh, um, those phenomena, those, those collective behaviors of alignment and um, and attraction. Uh, that's one of the places where uh, the fact that cave fish and surface fish can be crossbred uh, comes in handy because you can you can make cave um, uh, cave surface hybrids. And look whether they have attraction, whether they have uh, alignment, whether they have both, um, and, and whether they arise at the same time. Um, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, all right, so it's uh, time to wrap up. Um, the um, the first point I, I hope I've conveyed is that the, the Mexican tetra is a, a, an exciting species to uh, study the evolution of collective motion. Uh, as I've said, it, it's still early days of, of applying the physical approach to collective motion to uh, to the species, but uh, there's a a great body of work um, by a biologist on on not just collective motion but a number of other traits because the cave fish also um, have reduced aggression and and um, and reduced sleep and and all sorts of other um, behavioral differences. Um, they one of the cool things about it is that they de-evolve schooling not once but multiple times in in different caves, um, and um, and they re-optimized their collective motion um, for food scarcity in darkness. Uh, and so one of the signatures of that seems to be this um, this uh, exploration, this uh, shift of the exploration strategy uh, from mostly following the walls when it's not too crowded to to being a little bit bolder maybe and exploring uh, further away from the walls when it's less crowded. 
and um, and we seem to see that uh, alignment develop a little before attraction uh, during larval development in surface fish. Uh, but we we need to uh, to do more studies to um, to confirm that. And cave fish um, doesn't uh, don't develop either at any point. Um, all that's left for me to do is is thank uh, all of the contributors in this work and uh, and thank you for your attention. I'll take any question. Thank you, Yawen, for a great talk. Once again, I will clap on behalf of everybody. And and so we have time for a few questions. Uh, so the first question is from Sonia Behar. Uh, is there any uh, evidence that cave fish can sense each other using their lateral line rather than vision, or that lateral line sensitivity is different in cave fish versus surface fish? Um, yes and yes. So um they do they they can't see so so the way um or, or the current assumption is that the way they detect each other is through that lateral line and um and that's uh probably why they only um they they don't avoid each other when they're still far away right they they're able to sense somehow the, the crowdness of the tank but they're not able to to um, tell very efficiently. Oh, there's, there's. Uh, I'm on a collision path with, um, with another fish. Um, and yes, to the second question as well. Uh, they do have uh, an enhanced lateral line. They have a, a much higher density of neuromasts, uh, and, and that's one of the things that that's been uh, studied extensively. Um, and and that's a, a feature that all of those cave populations share. It's one of the, of the common uh, evolved traits of that cave form. Thank you, Yao. And we have time for one other quick question before we go to the uh, Q and A. So this is a question from uh, Nandan K. And Nandan is asking: Did the graph of speed distribution show data from blind variants or seeing variants? I think. Yeah, I think it's this, this one. one. What yeah. do you mean, line variants? So, not aligned, blind. Ah, sorry. Are these um, blind fish or are these fish that can see? Th those are the blind fish. Those are the the cave fish. So we don't uh, we don't see this slowdown in in surface fish. So um, that's why we, we think it may be uh, an evolved trait of cave fish um, that uh, could be a a way to optimize their exploration strategy for uh, possibly food foraging in um, in a cave in a dark environment. All right. Thank you, Yawen. Uh, I think we have time for one other quick question before we switch to the other format. So uh, this is from Mahesh Gandhikota, and Mahesh is asking, do the surface fish have some capacity of infrared vision, which may enable them to see other fish by detecting body heat, even when the lights are turned off? Oh, that's such a cool question. I have no idea, <laughs> but I will definitely look into it. I, I'm not aware of it. I, I like to think that um, if anything was known about that, uh, my my um, biologist collaborators would have let me know about it. But I'll definitely double check. All right. Thank you, Yao. 